The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Please open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 4. I'll begin in verse 13 and go to the end of the chapter, which is verse 18. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Remember, as I read and as you follow along and listen, this is, this is God's Word. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Our Father, we thank you for your word. And we ask that you would attend your word with great power and conviction even now. And we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. One of the most influential uh, works of philosophy, it's really hard to categorize it as just a work of philosophy, but it is that, uh, of the latter half of the 20th century, was a book written in the early 1970s by Ernst Becker, and it's called The Denial of Death. Becker was actually a cultural anthropologist, but he engaged heavily with philosophical and even theological sources in the writing of this book. It was so influential that it won the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction in 1973 and had a wide-ranging impact on many people uh, even down to this day. The basic thesis of the book is this. Becker, who is an atheist, he did, as far as I know, ha have no living faith in God. Uh, Becker posited in looking at various cultures and in looking at various philosophical systems that human culture was simply an elaborate defense mechanism in particularly its ritual aspects, an elaborate defense mechanism against this overwhelming fear of death that all people have at their core. Becker further went on to argue that this isn't just true at a societal level, that societies develop these elaborate defense mechanisms, but Becker argued, in fact, that individuals develop these elaborate defense mechanisms. And in various ways, sometimes in sophisticated ways, sometimes in very unsophisticated ways, like escapism of various kinds, human beings are engaged in this elaborate, sophisticated, sometimes even under the surface, denial of death. That it looms in front of them, they know it looms in front of them, and yet they can't quite make sense of it or deal with it in normal and rational ways. Whether Becker's thesis is exactly right or not in all of its broadest uh, strokes, there is no question, and the Bible affirms this, that we do live in the fear of death apart from a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what the author of Hebrews tells us, that he, he delivered us from the fear of death, as if this were something that were the natural state of all human beings, this, this fear of death. And it's probably the case that if you grab someone on the street and ask them if they were afraid of death, they might deny it. They might say it's something they don't think about at all. Uh, but as Becker would posit, and as I think the Bible would affirm, uh, while they might not consciously be thinking about it, that, it's, that in itself is a way of them trying to escape this fear of death. Now, the fear of death has, been all, has always been with us. And in many respects, of course, it was even more pronounced or more out front. You can avoid it in some of the ways we avoid it today in the first century. If you look at the mortality rates, for instance, in the area of Judea, and this is the letter to the Thessalonians, so it's northern Greece, but the mortality rates are not too different. If you look at the, the mortality rates for Judea in the first century, 
what one scholar, Mayor Barilan, who is a senior lecturer in Jewish history at Barilan University, said this, 30% of people who were born died before age 18, and the average age, if you lived past that, was approximately 40. That was your average life expectancy. And he says, if you lived past 18 at all, you rarely lived much past 50. Now, of course, there are exceptions to that. We see even exceptions in the Word of God. The Apostle John, no doubt, lived longer than 50 years old. But nonetheless, this is the norm. Uh, this is the average that you'd see in that time and place. And how much more so among the Thessalonian Christians? Because they weren't just dealing with the average life expectancy of their day. They were actually dealing with the additional threat, which was a very real threat, of being killed for their faith. So death was inescapable. Death was all around them. And while men in that day, just like men today, tried to deny death, it was hard to deny the reality of death that faced them on a daily basis. And it's because of that, because of that looming knowledge of death, that Paul writes these words at the end of 1 Thessalonians 4. Because even within the church, what Paul recognized was they had experienced a great deal of death. I was speaking with one of our uh, graduates, Mike Myers, on Monday, and he just passed the 10th anniversary at his congregation. He was a planting pastor over in Royston, Georgia. And he said it was interesting in the, in the weeks leading up to the 10th uh, anniversary to review all the records of, uh, of the things that had happened, you know, the major events, the baptisms, the weddings, and the funerals. And I believe he said, I, I believe this is correct, that he said that they had had one funeral at the church in 10 years. Now, certainly that was not the case in the Thessalonian church. This Thessalonian church, which had not been around for probably even 10 years when Paul wrote this letter, probably far fewer years than that, had seen many deaths in their midst. And so Paul writes this to them in order that they might have a Christian understanding of, of death and particularly of death for those who died in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the way he does this, if we were to outline these paragraphs, the way he does this is he begins by stating two goals in his teaching. Those two goals really come in verse 13. And then he follows those two goals with one reminder of something that he had already taught them, but that they needed to have reviewed for them. And then after the one reminder, he gives a description. He gives a vivid account of something that will happen. And then at the end, one application. So two goals, one reminder, one description, and then one major application at the end. Well, let's look at how this unfolds in the Word of God. First, in verse 13, we see the two goals that Paul has for his teaching. The first goal is really stated negatively. In fact, both goals are stated neg negatively. There's something that he does not want them to fall into does not want them to suffer from as they see death all around them, as they mourn the death, even of those Christians within the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing he says is, we do not want you to be uninformed about what's happening here. We don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. It's a reminder, of course, that Paul's ministry was a teaching ministry. Uh, Paul saw his role as an apostle and, in a sense, as a kind of church planter in the church of Thessalonica as primarily concerned with teaching people the truths of God, teaching people the truths, of course, primarily about the Lord Jesus Christ and about the way of salvation, but teaching people what God's Word said and what God's Word was for them. It also shows, I think, Paul's great concern here for this church in Thessalonica. When he thought about them, and he put pen to paper under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you notice how often he says in this letter, I, I just want to make sure you're reminded of this. I just want to make sure you're informed of this. I just want to make sure you're knowledgeable about this. Paul's great concern, and this I think ought to shape our understanding of priorities in ministry. Paul's great concern for the Thessalonians was not so much that they would be physically preserved and physically safe. No doubt, as, 
as a human being, he cared about them in that way. He wanted them to be safe. He wanted them to be physically preserved. But again and again, what's Paul's chief concern? What's chiefly on his heart? Chiefly what's on his heart is that they not get away from the teaching that he had given them and that they know and grow in their knowledge of the Word of God. That's our priority as well. That has to be our priority in pastoral ministry. Yes, we're concerned about physical needs. Yes, we're concerned about the health of our congregation. Yes, we're concerned when they're suffering and struggling and and, and financial difficulty. All those things ought to be matters of personal concern. We see warrant for that in the Scriptures. But the primary concern, the thing that is foremost in our mind, because it's their greatest need, is that they have a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and a growing knowledge of the Word of God. So Paul says, what I'm about to say addresses that issue. Yeah, I would love to be there and put my arm around you and help you as you weep and mourn as those in the congregation die. I would love to be there for that, but, but I'm not writing you just to give you some kind of emotional comfort or support or to talk about all the good things that those people who have died were and did. No, I, I, don't, I just don't want you to be uninformed as you go through it. I want you to have the right perspective. I want you to know all that you need to know in order to navigate these things. I wonder how well, you know, as we think even about our own priorities in ministry, and we talk about the priority of teaching, the priority of preaching, I wonder as well if if we might add to that the priority of giving people the knowledge that they need to go through these kinds of circumstances. You know, there is a very real sense in which it's true what the old ministers used to say, we're preparing people to die. And in this case, Paul's saying, what I'm doing is I'm preparing you to watch others die. And what an important ministry task that is. Now, the other thing he says is that I don't want you to be uninformed and, and I don't want you to grieve as those who have no hope. We see here the, the link between doctrine and action, doctrine and practice. If they knew the truth, if they were really persuaded of the Lord's teaching on death, then that was going to have consequences in how they grieve. And that's important because how they grieve is is a kind of testimony to others. And how they grieve is is going to be vital for them and and those closest to them. And Paul said, make no mistake, I want you to to know the right things about those who have died, but know those right things in order that your action in the midst of death will be appropriate. Again, that's not wrong for us to to teach. Uh, That's not wrong for us to aim at for people. I want you, as you face this challenge, to know what you need to know, and I want you to, as you face this challenge, to face it and to behave and to react and to respond, even at the deepest emotional level of grief. I want you to grieve in the right way, not as those who have uh, no hope. I think at a broad level, too, we should continually ask ourselves in our ministries, as Paul no doubt did here, what is it that our people are uninformed about? What is it that they really wouldn't be prepared for based on what we've been able to teach them? Uh, What is it that we haven't been able to cover but but could sort of sneak up on them and and, and come at them uh, unawares? Well, Paul's thinking about that. He's seeing and hearing of these who are dying and saying, "I, I, I, I need to keep you informed and I need to make sure that you don't grieve as those who have no hope. Those are the goals. Those are the goals in what he's about to teach. Now, what's the reminder? The reminder is really the the cornerstone of all of Paul's teaching here. And the reminder is something that they did know, and we'll see that they had to have known it in order for them to even be Christians at all. There's something they did know, but perhaps they hadn't considered the implications of for their situation of grieving. And the reminder, of course, is this, that Jesus died and rose again from the dead. We see that in verse 14. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Jesus died and Jesus rose again. And that, Paul recognizes, is the ultimate proof 
the ultimate demonstration of the fact that all of these resurrection promises that God has made to His people will come true one day. You can go all the way back to the Old Testament and see what a, what a significant role the resurrection of the body plays in the Old Testament believer's understanding of himself and of God and of the future. This is why the patriarchs took such great pains with where their bones were laid. It was a way of them showing their confidence in God's promises and their hope for the resurrection of the body. We might even think of Job, who probably lived around that time of the patriarchs. And in the midst of his deepest despair, his deepest confusion, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in my flesh I will see my God. When we think about the book of Daniel, where at the end of that book, in chapter 12, it's made crystal clear to God's people that there will be a bodily resurrection to righteousness and to judgment. In fact, actually, even archaeologists and those who look at ancient history will tell you that this is one of the significant features of the Jewish religion. If you want to just look at it from a religious perspective, we could say that one of the key features, one of the things that sets them apart from other ancient faiths is their conviction uh, uh, that, that God will one day raise them from the dead bodily. And that bodily resurrection is so, so closely held and so significant, you can even see it in the burial practices. You can tell when you're digging in certain areas whether these, are, these were Jewish people who were self-consciously trying to uh, live by the Old Testament law or, or people who were Gentiles. And one of the ways you can tell is because of their burial practices. Because Jews were always very careful with how the body was preserved because they believed in the resurrection of the body. And Paul, of course, taught that very clearly, teaches it very clearly in other passages of Scripture, and, and reminds these Thessalonian Christians, and indeed reminds us, that that future bodily resurrection is wrapped up in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul calls it, else calls the resurrection first fruit of our resurrection. You see that? and you know that the harvest is going to come in the future. I think it also serves to demonstrate this resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. This, this serves to demonstrate Jesus' power to fulfill His promises. The Lord Jesus Christ has promised uh, that, he will, uh, that He will be with us, that He will bring, him, uh, bring us to be with Him, that we will have resurrection bodies one day. And His resurrection is proof that His promises are true. Now, there are questions, of course, here in 1 Thessalonians, although he does address them elsewhere, uh, as in his letter to the Corinthians, about what this body will be like and how this resurrection body will take place and the continuity and discontinuity between our bodies now. But the fundamental fact of the bodily resurrection is found throughout the Scriptures, and Paul says, if you needed the absolute final proof for it, remember that Jesus Christ died and was raised again. Now then, he moves from that reminder, that key reminder, and if we lose that, of course, we've lost everything, that key reminder uh, to a description. And the description uh, begins in verse 15, and then really goes all the way through verse 17. It's kind of one long description of the nature of this future hope. Because Jesus is raised from the dead, we know it will happen. But what will it look like? How will it play itself out? Well, he says that we who are alive, verse 15, those of us who remain alive and who are still here when the Lord returns, won't precede those who have fallen asleep. In other words, we're not first, they're first. So those ones who have died, uh, if, if we're here when the Lord returns, those who have died will actually be ahead of us in this chain of events. And what is the chain of events? The Lord Himself, verse 16, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's the sequence of events, and that takes up really the bulk of the paragraph, Paul's description of how things will play out. And he's very clear, it doesn't 
take too much time for us to understand or, or pick apart what He says. What He says is that what will happen is Jesus will return as He promised. You remember when He ascended into heaven? It was made clear to those who are watching He will come back in the same way He ascended. So when He does that, when He descends to the earth, uh, those who are dead will be raised up, will meet Him, will be with Him, and, and then all of us who are remaining, who are alive at that time, will be caught up to meet the Lord and really to be with them in the air. The Lord will descend, the dead will rise, those who remain will be caught up to meet them in the air. And then, of course, those final words that we shall always be with the Lord after that time. Now, for some of us, depending on the background that you've come from, you might even uh, try to uh, distance yourself from this teaching. This teaching, uh, we could even say this teaching of the rapture. That's the, 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 the Latin word that we derive from description in verse 17. Of course, the reason for that is because we're trying to distance ourselves from certain ways in which this has been described as playing out in, in the sequence of eschatological events. But the facts that are here are facts that are of vital importance for us and for our understanding of death and for the way in which we grieve when we see others die. Uh, Paul believes that these facts matter, and these facts help explain to us and comfort us in the midst of our grief. And, and the facts are, as I've said, the Lord descends, the dead rise, we're caught up to meet with them in the air if we're still alive, and then we are together with the Lord forever afterwards. You know, the content of our eschatology it does make a difference in our daily living, in our convictions about uh, how it is that we're supposed to even behave in the midst of great challenges. It is a striking feature in the Bible that when uh, people are addressed who are suffering the most, what the Lord often does is reveals to them things about the future. I mentioned Daniel earlier. Well, what's the context of the book of Daniel and that great resurrection passage in Daniel chapter 12? Well, the context is at the very beginning in the first verse of the book, Nebuchadnezzar has taken the city. It's a book written to those in exile. Or we think perhaps about the book of Job. Again, great suffering and a great revelation about the future and our future hope. Or even the book of Revelation with all of its complexity, with all of its imagery, with all of the ways in which it also speaks to right now, it does speak to the future as well. And that was written in a time of suffering. John is in exile on the island of Patmos. And here with the Thessalonian church, what could be more practical for them in the midst of their difficulties than to hear more about what will happen at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? And that's why we get to the application at the end. I said there was one reminder, one description, and one application. And the application is fairly straightforward that Paul has in verse 18. What does he want them to do with this? How does he want them to apply this to their lives? Well, the way he wants them to apply it to their lives is to use it to comfort one another. So imagine that when they, see, when they saw someone uh, close to them die. The family was mourning in the church. Paul imagines that they would then go to that person and in a, of course, a sensitive and an appropriate way, say, remember that, that those who are dead in Christ will actually go ahead of us and meet the Lord and be with Him forever and will all be with Him forever. Paul believed that these facts, these eschatological facts, were actually going to serve as comfort in the midst of this looming threat of death. I wonder if you've thought about the comfort in these words. Oftentimes I think we gravitate towards comfort that's not actually what the Bible pushes us towards in those situations. How many of us, if we encountered someone who is suffering greatly, would say to them, you know what you need? is you really need to study the Bible's teaching about eschatology. It might be the last thing we would do. We might consider that the, the least practical thing we could do to someone. Like, oh, if, they're, if, they, if they need comfort, the last thing you want to do is to talk to them about the Lord's return. 
No, but again and again in Scripture, that's precisely what the Lord uses. The Lord, of course, knows how to counsel us far better than we know how to counsel ourselves or counsel our people. And what the Lord does, what the Apostle Paul does, is he says, let me tell you about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about the rapture of those who are alive and remain and how they'll be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and be with Him forever. Encourage one another with these words. Now, that's the application that Paul gives, but I think as we take a step back, we might also draw a few other conclusions or see some more implications from this. First of all, I think we can draw some important implications, as I've mentioned throughout this passage, about Paul's view of his own ministry, what it was that was important, what he could do best for the people, and what they needed most in the midst of their struggle and suffering. He doesn't try to take their mind off of it. He doesn't try to distract them from death. He certainly doesn't deny death. No, what he does is he, he gives them this clear teaching about what happens after death and about the promises of Jesus in the midst of facing death. And so I think we learn something about pastoral ministry and about comfort and about counseling and about being a good friend in the midst of death. But I think we also learn some profound lessons here about the Lord Himself. One of the obvious things that we learn about our God is that our God cares about His children and cares for His children even after death. How easy it is in human history and even in our individual lives to forget about people particularly after they die. I was speaking with someone this morning, and he was describing some challenges in his family. It had to do with the fact that uh, a relative's wife had died, and, and, and the man had, had sort of forgotten her right away. And, and there's a sense in which that is, that is a, a natural thing that happens, but, but not the Lord. You know, our God is a shepherd who leads us through the valley of the shadow of death, but, but He is a God who will bring us after death to be with Him forever. Uh, we, he's not forgetting about us when we die. Uh, everyone else might forget about us. But they probably will forget about us in a very short time. No, but the Lord, the Lord preserves His children even after death. And they go to be with the Lord forever. He will raise us up one day. And we know that because He raised up the Lord Jesus Christ, as the first fruits of our own resurrection. There is nothing that we have for a legacy, for a memory of us that will last. And yet God preserves His people even after death. In fact, it's really the great hope that we have in the midst of death. Not only is the Lord's care for His people so evident in these promises, but the Lord's power even over death, is evident in the midst of this. You know, we know in our, in our most honest moments, both individually and culturally, we know that there really isn't anything we can do to keep death from happening. We may ignore it. We may deny it. We may try our best to prolong our lives. But we know that death is inevitable. And here is one in the Lord Jesus Christ who has the power even over death. Remember how it's put in Revelation chapter 5, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. This is the one who conquered death. That's who we're hoping in. We can put our trust in no one and nothing else after death because no one or nothing else has the power over death. As we face that looming great enemy, it's only through the Lord Jesus Christ that we can have hope. And isn't that too what we read at the beginning of the book of Revelation? Remember when John sees this one, it says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I die, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys to death and Hades. That's what we need to bear in mind. That's the one we need to proclaim to our people. The one who actually has the keys 
to death in Hades. Yes, he, Lord, the Lord will transform the lives of those who believe Him right now by His Holy Spirit. And He's at work to conform us to the image of Christ. And, and God, in His grace, can, can change people and change families and change situations. But, but all of that, in a sense, somewhat pales in comparison to the fact that He has the keys to death and Hades. He's conquered death itself, that which nothing else could do. This is more than any guru or teacher could ever promise. We're proclaiming the one who has the keys to death and Hades. Now, of course, along with that, though, we have to say this, that for those who are outside of Christ, for those who do not know this one, there is no hope apart from Christ. And that, too, is something we can't shy away from proclaiming. There's that double edge in the book of Revelation, that Jesus Christ is the one in whom we can put our hope and trust and confidence, even in the face of death, changes the way we grieve, and yet nonetheless, since He is that one, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He's the only hope for salvation in the face of the enemy, death. Well, we read something like this and we realize that not only was Paul a gifted and caring and loving apostle and father in the faith, Thessalonians, not only is he a model pastor, but we have to say, when we read a passage like this, what a friend we have in Jesus. Uh, we can carry all of our needs to him in prayer. We can hope in him, trust in him, even as we go through death itself. Comfort one another with these words. Let's pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, for the comfort and hope that it gives to us. May we hold tightly to these things. May we share these things with others. May these things change the way we grieve. We thank you for the work of our Lord Jesus Christ who has conquered death. And he promises those who are in him the resurrection one day. We look forward to that day. We know that you're being patient with us during this time. As we pray that we wouldn't make light of that patience and that time that you've entrusted to us, but we do look forward to the coming of Christ. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.